We live in an extreme world of ambiguity. We have to make our best guess. We have data. We'll never ever have perfect data at any one point in time. We go with what we know and we kind of roll the dice. Um, as long as we have a data-driven approach, uh, you know, some tool to be able to really help us have real-time visibility to our data, to, you know, we just even have a gut feel, you know, we should always roll the dice. You know, it's a bold and decisive action will ultimately lead to our success. Hello, folks. Today on Decoding the Digital Industrial Revolution, we have the privilege of diving into the insights of a seasoned executive whose career has been marked by transformative leadership in finance and operations. With over 20 years of experience, he's driven financial excellence across the manufacturing, supply chain, e-commerce, and distribution sectors. His expertise in globalizing and optimizing operations through technology and data-driven solutions has not only ensured sustainability and scalability, but also positioned his organization for robust growth and efficiency gains. Join us as we welcome Michael Stutz, Chief Financial Officer at DDM Concord. Awesome, thank you for joining us, Michael. Oh, thank you for being here, Harv, and uh, you know, thank you so much for inviting me to be a guest on your podcast. I'm honored to have the opportunity to share my insights and experiences with your audience and look forward to the conversation and you know, hopefully have an engaging discussion. Love it. I know that our audience is so looking forward to it. You have such a unique profile, the things that you've accomplished, your journey is truly inspiring. But let me back up and let me ask you, what does DDM Conca do and sort of what's your business model? Sure. One of the coolest thing that we do is we actually make blades. These cut through asphalt, concrete, and everything else. So as you see road construction, more than likely the blades that you're seeing cutting through that is our handiwork. Uh, we make the blades, the segments. Inside the segments, they have little pieces of industrial diamond, which goes through and cuts it even better than anything else. Um, you know, wow. that's really, we, we distribute throughout the United States, but cutting in concrete and asphalt is where our bread and butter is. I know you're not wearing gloves, so like, is it dangerous for people to carry or what? I think they'll be okay. I, we have, you know, different ways in which we carry the blades, you know, but for, you know, this blade, it should be easy enough. Lovely. I love the prop. That's awesome. So this is what you build. Where do you sell it? All over the world? All over the world. Uh, primarily inside the United States, 80% of our business, 85% is inside the United States. Uh, we sell it to, you know, primary grinding and grooving customers, some, you know, pro distributors and so forth. Uh, we do have some which is exported to Canada and Mexico. And any place where there's concrete and asphalt, that's where we'll find our blades. Lovely. So what I found super exciting was that you guys made all of this in the U.S. Am I correct? Absolutely. Wow. Made in the right USA here. is one of our proud, uh, proud tag buds. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, of course, um, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than having everything made in the U.S. But, of course, the value for products being made in the U.S., that nationalism and, of course, promoting industries and especially getting the essential stuff so it helps with national security and many other things in this geopolitical climate is extremely uh, helpful. And uh, I think and I think you're doing your part. So that's awesome. Now, for our listeners, could you share a bit of your background on how you came to specialize in finance and particularly finance and manufacturing and supply chain sectors? Like, how did it all start? Like, I know you grew up in Virginia, so I know you lived in uh, Atlanta for a very long time. But tell me more, like, how, how did you stumble upon being, a, you know, a CFO of a, such an amazing company? It all happened by luck. Uh, <laughs> truthfully, I, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do in high school. I found that I was actually really good at accounting, and that's what I did. I went through, I graduated, once I graduated from uh, UVA with my master's degree, my very first job was with Phillips Electronics as a plant manager, plant controller. This is back in the old days when TVs were huge, 
monsters uh, long, long, long time ago, and projection TVs were the same. Uh, but what I identified was that really we didn't have a lot of KPIs. You know, I was responsible for procurement, you know, the normal standard costing, you know, really folks on cost containment, compliance, you know, all these continuous improvement exercises, but we didn't really have a lot of KPIs. And that was one thing I was very proud to be able to really bring to that role is really a data-driven approach, you know, bring, you know, focusing upon the cost containment policies, compliance policies, ensure that, well, all our products have probably cost, so we can drive the necessary margin. Uh, they loved what I did. They brought me to Atlanta, where I was their controller for a while. Um, after that, I was lucky enough to be able to join Coca-Cola uh, in supply chain. Being that I live in Atlanta, I have to work for Coca-Cola at least once. So I uh, spent seven years there with Coke in supply chain distribution, transportation, procurement, you name it. And everything else, after those two great roles, I had a, a enough of a bandwidth inside of me. I started CFO positions, everything from food and beverage all the way now to more manufacturing, you know, uh, this manufacturing. Wow. So you've got a wide variety of experience, um, you know, across the board. But the general theme is being analytical, you know, thinking in numbers and data doesn't lie. I think that has been sort of what I can tell your core principle, which is amazing. Um, and, I, and I see that as well. And it's easy to get bogged down by, oh, it, it feels like a good deal or it feels like a good decision. No. What does the data tell you? So I think this is awesome. And that's, you know, something that I connect with, um, with you on this. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so as a CFO, as you were working for a lot of different companies, I mean, this is my personal question, you know, because sometimes I struggle with this. I struggle with, let's say I want to expand to a new geography, right? Let's say I like Australia and I'm like, okay, well, they don't have as many people as the U.S., but there's business and, you know, it's a developed country. I want to start my operations of providing digital transformation in Australia, then the challenge that I hit is that how much should I do an exercise of laying out all the KPIs and do the planning as opposed to how flexible I should be and say like, hey guys, you're my people. We're going to sit down, we're going to burn the midnight oil and we're going to figure it out together. So like... I've always struggled with this. This is a genuine question, you know, not even something that I planned on asking you, but how do you tackle that? So my son hates my favorite quote, and my favorite quote is, chance favors the prepared mind. And which means that we're always overly prepared. You know, to, to answer your question, it's always a gut feel. We go in with our best knowledge. You know, we live in an extreme world of ambiguity. We have to make our best guess. We have data. We'll never, ever have perfect data at any one point in time. We go with what we know, and we kind of roll the dice. Um, as long as we have a data-driven approach, uh, you know, some tool to be able to really help us have real-time visibility to our data, to, you know, we just even have a gut feel, you know, we should always roll the dice. You know, it's a bold and decisive action will ultimately lead to our success. And, you know, we always have to act in a way with that sense of passion and urgency. And if there is a plan to something you want to move forward on, understand there will always be ambiguity, uh, but definitely roll the dice and move forward as quickly as you can. I like that. I, I love that, in fact, because I have seen a lot of my buddies and other people that I follow, that I get inspiration from, they are always defaulting to action just do something no say yes no what about this like let's let's make it happen like um even you know the the famous book which way back when about 12 years ago i read probably one of my first few books that i read and then i hopped on this journey of reading hundreds of books but this one was from tim ferris and he had Tremendous quotes, and you know, at that time, it was uh, pretty exciting as well. But you know, that's that's um, something on those lines that he said as well. Like, um, you know, there were, there are were many quotes, but one of them was, 
your success is determined by the number of difficult conversations you have. And then another one, the exercise related to that was, if you want to do something, take the first action right away. The second, no, divide it into three steps. First action right away, second action before 11 a.m. in the morning, and the third action before the end of the day. You just got to make it happen, do it. There's no substitute to, to getting things done. Take action, even if you feel you learn something. So I think uh, that's, that's awesome. But what you're saying is make sure you've done your due diligence and you've done the analysis. There's no point in acting on just 15% information. That's what I got recommended You know, when I was in my 20s uh, from my board person. He was like, Arvin, I love the way you make decisions and you're so courageous, but you got to wait a little bit more to get more information. You decide on 15% information. Most people do it at 90. Can you get it up to like 65 or 70%? So I can totally relate and thank you for addressing that. Uh, this is fantastic. Well, let's segue into technology because, I mean, you know, I run a digital transformation company for the last 14 years. This is what I live, breathe, eat, do. This is what I think is going to change, you know, the world, the way we do business. Um, so can you elaborate on how you leverage technology and, you know, the data-driven solutions to enhance operational efficiency, financial performance, uh, you know, at your organization? What do you do in, in, in these areas to ensure that you are as successful as you are? You know, we are, you know, every business I work for, we are, we create a foundation where we're focused on technology, really data-driven solutions. And we have to have a really strong foundation in Six Sigma Lean Manufacturing and really a, a culture of continuous improvement. Getting into, you know, the, really the hard part. But as with both companies, we have an ERP. The ERP, of course, streamlines our operations, procurement production, gives us that real-time visibility it really helps to optimize our workflow. But what we also have is really advanced analytics. And, and that's one of the most important data-driven approaches are really the answer uh, to all our questions. You know, data doesn't lie or data doesn't lie unless we want it to. Uh, but, you know, we have these sophisticated analytical tools that can gather, analyze large volumes of data. Uh, a lot of focus on continuous improvements, you know, getting the best people in, getting them trade and real-time financial monitoring. Um, we were lucky enough, we've partnered with a group called Amper. And Amper has put little sensors on our equipment. And as our equipment gets goes down, uh, text messages are being sent. If the machine's down outside its predetermined number of hours or their 15 minute break time or 30 minutes or an hour, whatever it may be, no text messages, hey, you know, the machine's down. And what that does, that allows us to be able to act very quickly to ensure the machine's up and running, understand why the machine operator wasn't necessarily, you know, maybe operating the machine, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, very cool technology, and it's just, it really helps us. We've seen a, around a 15% overall improvement in OEE, really with the rollout of, uh, you know, of this technology, the IoT, and that we did this through Amper. Great side, the cost is not prohibitive. It's about $12,000, and we've got it on 12 different machines for a full course of a year. Very useful, very helpful. In a similar capacity, we have rolled out uh, a software. We call, it's called FIX, F-I-I-X, and it's AI-powered uh, computing really for maintenance systems. So, you know, for really focus on preventive maintenance. You know, any type of industry that you have, you're always going to have preventive maintenance, and, you know, downtime is always a, is a killer. Uh, but the um, fixed software, we go back through, we put our history of the equipment, you know, what's went down, what spare parts inventory do we have in place, and it will go through and make predictions of, you know, what's going to fail next. Uh, it is still its beginning, uh, you know, we're still early into its testing. But I do find it being a very, very viable solution in the long term. A uh, similar exercise, if anybody wants to do it, uh, you know, in the audience, it's really only about $500 a year, uh, minimal cost, and it provides a significant improvement, really focusing upon preventive maintenance. So, you know, really adapting this adaptability. Um, you know, ultimately, we must make AI part of our DNA. Right, that's really the future of the business. And 
You know, some, you know, some cultures play lip service to the philosophy that, you know, uh, failure is the, is, the, is the best teacher. <clears throat> now, in practice, people are afraid to take risk. I've been lucky enough to have a management team and an equity team, which allows us to be bold to, to make these leaps in technology, you know, to, to jump into, you know, these, you know, jump into new set technology with a passion. And my goal uh, as a finance is to always challenge preconceived notions. Focus on the really the why uh, and more the why not, you know, cut through, you know, hey, this happened 15 years ago and then, you know, go on that. Uh, But really the why, the why, why, uh, why not? And and get really to driving the business forward. You know, it keeps coming back, right? You know, you have to have that sense of urgency and really drive decisions forward. Love it. Love it. So I think the two key points that I got were one use of technology that you have is to have some sort of IoT that gives you the uptime or at least triggers some sort of notification when something's wrong. The other one you mentioned is the preventative maintenance. Of course, in manufacturing, that's all over. I mean, that's going to just become very, very popular. So I think these are the two key areas where you're using. And I know there are others because we've talked before and I know, um, you know, including demand forecasting and some other stuff. But we're, we're going to wait till we um, enlighten our audience with some of that. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I want to talk about supply chain resilience because, you know, in any manufacturing company, that is extremely, extremely important. So. And especially when you go back to the the, the pandemic days, um, the global supply chain disruptions, I mean, they caused a havoc. Um, so how are CFOs in manufacturing sectors reevaluating their financial planning strategies in post-COVID era to enhance supply chain resilience? Yeah, uh, excellent question. Uh, multiple ways Uh, we probably have about five different ways we're approaching it Uh, diversification of suppliers is paramount you know uh, many years ago we were a single source supplier everybody oh single source single source that's not really the way we need to approach about uh, supply chain anymore we have multiple suppliers ideal state we have suppliers very close at hand uh, very local suppliers which will be able to reduce our overall lead time and transportation and hopefully, to a certain degree, be able to hold our inventory for us to re- reduce our working capital. Uh, investment in technology, you know, IoT, right? Uh, you know, our ability to be able to track shipments where it is inside the country to ensure that the manufacturing production continues to flow. <clears throat> it really give us that visibility across supply chain and technologies to give us that the you know real time monitoring and data analysis. Is, that, is it a third party who? Who, who ships it to you? Are you responsible? Is the manufacturer responsible? If you have to receive those parts, how do you put those IoT devices to be able to track it? Well, we've got a great relationship with UPS and our vendors, which are you know, able to you know, put the units inside the tracking modules, you know, inside our containers as it's shipped in. Uh, it, it's, it's funny, right, how great the technology is. In most cases, we're shipping stuff uh, full truckload. We've had one, which was an urgent load. Uh, we actually it, found a group to be able to put it in the back of a truck, and they drove for 24, two drivers, so it's yeah. safe, right? You know, no no, no compliance issues. Uh, we had drivers put it in the back of a van and, dro- and drove it 20, effectively 24 hours to our facility to ensure that our manufacturing and our production did not stop. You know, wow. and we wouldn't have known any of that. We wouldn't have been able to have tracked the timeline, how long it would take, really without this, um, you know, IOT technology of tracking. So I guess then the answer is backup of a backup of a backup. Of course, don't rely on just one supplier. Things are very volatile in this ge- geopolitical environment, especially when you're dealing with countries that have to cross certain straits where there may be a lot of uh, hostility. It may be countries that have sanctions, um, and then it may be other uh, challenges as well. So the answer is have your options because the environment can change. So continue to 
uh, forge those partnerships and build those relationships and leverage technology on top of it so you have another level of transparency. I love that. You know, the example that comes to mind is we work for a company called Trinsight, and they had these train carriage cars that had temperature controlled, um, you know, shipping as well. I mean, besides, of course, the basics, the GPS and everything. Um, and that we integrated into a really user intuitive dashboard and that helped them a bunch. And I think that gave them that competitive edge. They're the largest in North America and uh, they now acquired some companies in Canada, but just working with them, I think, um, you know, it was, it was extremely complicated, but at the same time, the way that they were able to slowly create that entire fleet equipped with all of these IOT devices. And then, I mean, one would think, oh, you just integrate and that's fine. No, you have to present the data in a way that it's useful, not just to the command center, but taking it all the way to the, the customer to you know, increase that customer satisfaction. And I think nowadays with all the talk about artificial intelligence and automation, I mean, yes, that's, that's possible, but how do you see artificial intelligence and automation reshaping sort of the financial operations and decision-making in the manufacturing sector? Yep. Uh, you know, uh, excellent question. You know, we are, a couple of things which we're doing right now, we are in a beta test of really machine learning for our predicting our sales forecast. Of course, along with sales forecast goes with our demand planning. So still in the early stages, uh, keep in mind that it's quite a bit of work, right? You know, there's always removing any type of anomalous data from history, uh, but we are seeing a very positive trend inside of that. And we feed it in, it tells us, hey, here's what we're anticipating the at the SKU level, at the SKU at the customer level for really the next like two years. Uh, and then of course backs into what are the raw materials that we're going to need to purchase. So still in the very, very early preliminary stages, but there definitely is a significant amount of value inside of that. Uh, additionally, in a similar capacity, we are you know, really having a machine vision, we'll call it, where our segments will come through. There is a little camera that measures the segments, checks its density. So when it goes on one of our blades, it, it, it has that good quality that we would expect it to. Um, wow. Additionally to that, I mean, just the normal things you think about inside of finance, right? Sometimes finance can be relatively bland. Uh, I consider myself uh, operations finance because all the cool stuff happens on the operations side. And by the time it hits the financials, it's already too late. So, uh, you know, uh, in addition to, you know, really that it's, you know, real time financial monitoring, you know, uh, tracking KPIs, tracking the various metrics, uh, mo more important than anything else anymore is the managing cash flow, uh, really ensuring our working capital uh, is at a balanced component. Uh, additionally, you know, very much the predictive, uh, you know, analytics for supply chain. And, you know, looking at our cost, uh, we have found that, <clears throat> You know, some of the technology you have has a better ability to go in and identify trends that we personally wouldn't have noticed previously. We were able to then speak with our vendors and renegotiate both on with our freight providers, with raw material providers, even labor providers, uh, and, and really start working down the cost. So there's you multiple, off, you know, multiple great wins as we roll out technology even further. Um, Got it. So technology plays then a huge role. I think you mentioned three or four different examples of it. And, um, you know, that, that sounds very interesting. So if we were to just summarize that, I think the way that you're using artificial intelligence or automation is um, in artificial intelligence, you are able to um, obviously do the demand forecasting, you're able to, you know, understand what are some of, um, you know, like historically, like the way you probably did it, you know, as we've talked also in the past, like you dump all of your data, obviously you cleanse the data, you dump all that data, and then you start to identify those patterns. 
but then do you feed new information? I'll give you an example. Like we were working for one of the largest companies in the United States that does um, small repairs in, you know, mostly HVAC, so air conditioning repairs. And they wanted to know, because they hire a bunch of temporary workers as well, um, technicians. So they wanted to know how many calls are we going to get? They're like, the, the, the demand varies like there is no tomorrow. I mean, sometimes they're getting hundreds of calls and there are other times like literally 17 calls. So they're like, how do we predict how much to staff up or staff down or furlough? I mean, they had no idea. So they came to us and they had, you know, some idea that artificial intelligence and machine learning can, you know, can be uh, something that they want to leverage, they, that can help. And then we built a dashboard for them that would give them exactly the number of calls with the confidence level that they're going to get. And they're nationwide. So, um, but, but, but that really, really helped them. Um, you know, you would know like later on what we in. So I guess my question to you is then later on, we figured that how about we marry the weather data with this, right? There's the historical data. Obviously that's gold. And of course we had to tweak it a little bit, clean it up. But then once we added the weather data, the accuracy level, you know, went through the roof because why do people call air conditioning when it's burning hot in Texas? That's when you're like multiple ACs are going down. So based on the weather forecast, you know, it played a role in helping them stay as close as possible to the demand. So in your scenario as well, I guess what you're able to do is look at, um, you know, how the demand has been, um, you know, let's say in the fall or in, in the holiday season or, you know, whenever the construction's at the peak and then, you know, feeding some of that data, um, you know, into it again and again and then saying that, okay, well, with 93% confidence level, I can say that it's going to be this number and then you take a range and you, you, you know, it gives you insights to make those decisions, right? Yeah, it's not going to do the work for you, but it helps you make better decisions. Absolutely. You know, after we scrub the anomalous data, you know, we definitely have been able to, and then could, of course, we feed it by date, skew, customer, location, you know, anything really, as far as any jobs that we, you know, we know of, which are going to be any primary construction, we feed that in there. And at least our preliminary results uh, have been extremely positive in predicting this customer is going to want this particular SKU. Uh, and they do that and it's been pretty dang accurate uh, that we have. Of course, which is even better, right? Then it feeds into one of the biggest problems at any, at any company, right, is any, any type of obsolescence. And obsolescence is bad. So, you know, it helps us on SKU rationalization and helps us monitoring their level of inventory. So we have the right amount or hopefully the closest right amount uh, at any one point in time to be able to deliver the customer in a timely fashion. And getting them, you know, and, you know, it, it, like I said, it's in a very preliminary fashion, it has been extremely successful. Uh, definitely on the raw material side, ensuring that we have the, the right levels of raw materials to continue to support our operations. Uh, and really without too much human interaction to be able to get to that point. We always need people. Right, people have that knowledge base. Uh, you can think about it in terms of you know book smarts and street smarts. You know the computer will always give us the the book smart answer, um, but when we come to interpreting the data to a certain degree, we always have the street smarts of an individual. Love it, love it. Well, um, that sounds exciting. So. Uh, I guess those are some areas where artificial intelligence and overall technology can help. But there's another area that um, I've been noticing a lot across the board, you know, Fortune 500 companies as well as uh, some of the medium-sized companies as well have been trying this. Um, obviously, digital transformation, but digital transformation within financial processes um, which is automating things. However, like 
fine, everybody knows about this, right? Automation's been around and intelligent automation or even before this RPA has been around. But my question to you is, what are some of the key cybersecurity challenges that one has to be cognizant of as a CFO um, when you're using some of these technologies in the manufacturing companies? No. And, and you're right. You know, automation of routine tasks is an excellent way to win. You know, in some of my roles I came into, uh, we had a 15-day close. You know, after rolling out some of these automation of routine tasks, it pulled it down to five days. So significant, significant wins wow. related to automation of this routine task. Um, you know, data privacy and protection is is essential. You know, strict data privacy regulations, we have to ensure that our financial data, as well as individual data, is handled in a very secure fashion. That means, you know, everything we can do, we have the best technology to be able to ensure that we keep everybody secure, you know, keep it secure. Um, you know, implementing data protection measures, ensuring compliance with data handling. You know, we actually have even brought in people for penet uh, penetration testing of our servers, you know, looking for any opportunity. Now, you know, that being said, though, it, investing in a cybersecurity is it's it's essential for today because there's too much phishing, too much fraud, too much random occurrences. You know, uh, funny enough, we had uh, not more than about an hour ago, we received an invoice in, uh, and they was like, oh, here's the, here's the, you know, all the documentation, $9,000. Uh, my accounts payable person brought it to me. We don't know who the person is. They never existed. But what we made the phone call just to ask a few questions, and what they ultimately do is they send out hundreds of the same document to local businesses, and they hope that one or two people who aren't paying attention, who lack good controls, they will ultimately go through and pay it. So for the time wow. value of money, it's a pretty great win for them. You just have to be diligent, right? You, you have to be thoughtful. And, and we've rolled out, you know, similar training for, the, for our associates, looking at email addresses, making sure the email address is the right one. When in doubt, pick the phone up, call, right? You know, having that relationship and just, I mean, honest to God, sometimes just common sense. Don't click on any links that you don't really know. You know, uh, that being said, uh, it is essential that companies have cyber liability policies. So if you don't have one, definitely get a cyber policy because at some point in time, unfortunately, everybody will probably be hacked and these cyber policies will go a far and away to, you know, get you back on your feet. Then it's, it's definitely a win, but it, totally. people are innovative and it's very interesting, but it's something you really have to be you know, really focus on that cybersecurity to make it to make it exciting and to make sure everybody's secure. I agree with you. And, you know, we're seeing it so often now. Like one of my very close friends, she works at Helena Agri. And, you know, they're a chemical company. They produce chemicals and then they sell it as fertilizers or something. But, you know, just a regular business. And, you know, they have a small IT team, maybe less than a dozen people that are managing everything, $6 billion in revenue, and boom, one fine day, everything's locked. The office shuts down. There is nothing that they can do. It was a ransomware, like an attack, and it says, okay, give me X millions of dollars. We're like, oh my God. I mean, it's just, it's just scary. So I wonder if there is a CFO out there who's thinking that, yes, I do want to, you know, get the benefits of the technology and I want to equip it with the IoT and I want to have all these, you know, new automation processes and the third party services. But, you know, that's the way that a malware enters or, you know, that's that's inviting, um, you know, a whole new risk you know, into your company. And, you know, for me, I think it's a balancing act. Yes, there may be some risks. Yes, um, you know, it makes us a little bit more vulnerable. But at the same time, there's tons of very smart people that are working on finding solutions and staying ahead of the bad guys. I mean, that's how I look at it. 
I want to I want to try every single new um, technology that uh, perhaps my customers would eventually need, uh, so that I can give an honest review of you know what this this works, this doesn't work, or this has these uh, you know types of challenges, or the benefit um, outweighs some of the risks that you're taking. Because hey, we're taking risk when we walk out the door, when we drive the car. Um, you know, there, there are so many risks, but you just got to mitigate some of those risks and have a balanced approach. Look at the reward versus, um, you know, some of uh, the downside there is. Um, so you have a greater chance of one of your associates clicking on a bad link or doing something like that than you do of somebody hacking into your software through IoT or through anything else. That's where it's where True. really the it's the human clicking of a link. They're not thinking. They're not checking an email address. That's where there's a greater likelihood. Uh, what we do to help offset that is, as with everything, software is king. Uh, we use Proofpoint, uh, which also is our software email monitoring system, and more especially, and I, I actually love the software name, uh, Velociraptor, and which goes through at digs through everything that you have, all your emails, your server, all your code, and it will eliminate any type of malicious wear. So it is it is definitely a, there, I agree with you, there's always a balance. And the, fortunately that we're lucky enough that we've got some brilliant people who know how to code and come up with, you know, great ways to, to help technology make the most of it. Love it, love it. No, and um, for us ourselves, we're, trying out a lot of these tools and uh, being in the know, like what latest, greatest is coming up. We're partnered with Ordinate, Felina, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of other companies as well to ensure. But even, like, barring technology, bad guys are going to continue to find ways to come after you. Like, you won't believe, you know, I, I don't know, dozens, maybe hundreds of people received a text message with my picture on WhatsApp saying, yeah. hey, hey, wh where are you? Um, I'm in a meeting. Oh, uh, I need you to do something quick for me. Send me $500 gift card from Walmart right away. Dude, yeah, you know, and they were smart enough, of course. And I mean, ours is a company of engineers and, you know, MBAs. So I think they can step back and think, okay, well, is Arvind really going to ask me for that? But for some of the other companies, you know, that are um, um, maybe employing certain people who may not be very familiar with the technology or something. I think it, it poses a much, much bigger challenge. And, you know, that's where sort of the ethical considerations come in as well. So what ethical considerations should finance leaders keep in mind as we deploy AI everywhere? And as we leverage big data analytics, uh, specifically in the manufacturing field, like where does the ethics um, come in play here? From your perspective, what emerging technologies or trends do you believe will most significantly impact the manufacturing industry, let's say in the next five to 10 years? That's a long time horizon, but what are some of the most significant ones according to you? It's going to be continued expansion of what we have. You know, looking at being able to our uh, determine supply planning, supply and demand planning. Uh, you know, really having the instantaneous communication with our vendors, ensuring that we have the you know, IoT. You know, we instant and you know visibility for our supply chain. Uh, you know, the flexible financial models, so we can you know uh, determine any dem uh, demand and supply conditions that might change. Scenario Love planning, it. it's really everything that comes into it. The stuff that we think we can do now is going to be beyond any level of our imagination in five to ten years from now. Um, totally. It's we it's haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, I, I truly believe that. I mean, most businesses are going to change in five to ten years in a way that we won't even be able to recognize the business models are going to change. I mean, we're at a time that's so unprecedented, like, um, you know, and, and I feel lucky to be here um, and, and looking at 
What are some of the really amazing innovations that are happening? I mean, and we're not even going, you know, to uh, quantum computing and some of the other stuff that hasn't come down to the practical use. But I, I hear you in manufacturing. I mean, demand forecasting, uh, predictive maintenance, better transparency, um, you know, more information for everybody. I think some of these things are going to just completely change the way we do things. Okay, well, to my last question, for aspiring CFOs, you know, people who really are inspired with your journey, who want to be a CFO for a large company. I know you guys have existed for, what, since 1945 or something, and you came in and increased the profitability and, uh, you know, a lot of other KPIs and metrics. So kudos to amazing work that you've done. But for the other aspiring CFOs, whether they're in school, you know, getting their CPA, whether they have, uh, you know, other like an MBA in finance or something, and that's what they want to do, and they love the manufacturing sector. Um, so if they are looking to excel in the manufacturing sector, what advice or insights would you offer to them, uh, you know, based on your career journey? So any words of wisdom would go a long way. Absolutely. You know, be open to collaboration. Uh, be true to yourself, right? You know, I found that as long as we treat people with respect and we are all working for the same goal, people will be open to your thoughts, open to your ideas. Be prepared with data, you know, data-driven approaches. Uh, you know, the ultimate answer is always data. You know, have that open you know, openness that, you know, you're allowing people to talk and be themselves. Because, you know, most people have brilliant ideas, and sometimes they just need a listening person to listen and talk it through a little bit more to, to make it make sense. Be open to new technologies. You know, be that hard worker, you know. Uh, work smarter, not harder. Well, well, that's not always the case, but, you know, in the perfect world, it is. Work smarter and harder. There you go. It's exactly right. Uh, you know, think about your business as don't just silo yourself in finance. You know, be that operations finance person that has that relationship so you know the business. And think about it in terms really of a holistic Love that view. advice, by the way. Love that advice. You know, because in my experience as well, I remember we were working for this company and um, the CFO would sit in strategy meetings, like actual technical product roadmap meetings. And it wasn't like a very small company. This was a large company. And I love that about him. So, no, this is great. I guess then um, to summarize your advice is, Obviously, be open. Love that. Of course, you know, by by openness, you open new opportunities. If you're keeping it to yourself, nobody knows this is what you want. I mean, and I have tons of examples by just being open, honest, upfront, offering information. The other person's like, oh, this is what's going on. I've got a solution. Or why don't we collaborate? And they would never know unless you opened up. So extremely important of course, uh, you know, being being open and honest and collaborative there. And I think, uh, you know, some of the other things that you mentioned as well on, um, you know, making sure that you are treating people the way you want to be treated. Um, I think some of the other things that you mentioned as well, um, you know, like uh, overall, like not just work smart, but also work hard. Michael, this is so inspiring. And with that, folks, we've reached the end of today's podcast. I have uh, really, really enjoyed this. I hope you've enjoyed this amazing discussion as well and all the amazing insights that are shared by Michael Stutes. Um, I must say that the journey through finance, technology, and the future of manufacturing has been eye-opening for me. Remember, the world of business is constantly evolving. So... Stay curious and proactive in embracing this change. Join us next time as we continue unraveling the mysteries and marvels of digital industrial revolution. Until then, keep innovating and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Goodbye.